Yes, thank you. Uh, and I'm trying to share my screen. So you should be able to see that now. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't have a webcam, uh, but here's a picture of me. Uh, as Hannibal said, my name is Nimulai, and I will be guiding you through Unity today. Um, normally, I teach at VIA. Uh, I teach uh, Unity game development and uh, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, but today, we are going to be doing uh, the basics of Unity. Um, so, of course, you're not here to look at my face, so let's get that out of the way. You are here to be looking at Unity. So, uh, first off, let's talk about what we are going to be doing today. Uh, I'll be showing you some of the basics of how Unity works. Uh, so by the, the end of today, you should be able to create your own little 3D world, um, like what you can see here, uh, where we have some objects, we can change how they look. Uh, we can even make a little bit of stuff happen. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the sound of this, um, but yeah, we can have stuff fall down uh, we can have animations and texturized, texturized 3D models, uh, and we can have some some sound. Uh, so we can add music to to it. Uh, so you should, by the end of the day, be able to set up your own 3D world with some assets you have created. Um, so, uh, yeah. So we're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, with what is a game engine actually. Uh, and historically, a game engine was basically this idea that people found out that when they were making games, there were some things that they always had to do. Uh, so you always, when you're making a game, want to show something on, on the screen. You probably want to play some sounds. You want to do something with the input from the, the player. Um, so all of this stuff was something you had to do every time you started a game. So they gathered all of that stuff together. And then they found there are also some things that are useful to have tools for. For example, we want to say that there is a player in the, the level and he starts over here. And then there are three enemies and they start over here. Uh, and there's uh, a floor and it's down here and it's big and flat uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so we can make a tool for setting up our levels. Uh, so. That way, we, we make some tools that are also useful for making games and add that into what we call a game engine. And uh, over time, we just got more tools, more things that are useful, uh, and that became the modern game engine, like Unity. Um, yeah, and the result is this game engine that you can think of as just a program for making games the same way that Word or Google Docs is a program for making documents. Um, and the reason why we are making this uh, this session today is because there seem to be this uh, thing where some people think, well, just as long as the programmers know how to do Unity, that's fine. But really, it can be very useful for everyone to know Unity. Uh, because, well, for one thing, it's where everything comes together, uh, scripting, 3D models, sound, game design, all of this uh, comes together in Unity. And so it's it's useful for everyone to be able to go in there and at least know how things work. Uh, so for example, for an artist, it can be really useful to be able to go into Unity and actually see what how what they've made uh, looks in Unity and how it's used in there, and maybe even uh, change it a bit by, on their own. Um, uh, so now let's get started with actually looking at Unity. Uh, if I'm you follow sorry, the guide, but I don't think we can see your Unity. Oh no, uh, I, I haven't got Unity up yet. Oh, okay. Uh, you sorry. should be able to see Unity Hop now. Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, yeah. So if you followed uh, along with the, the guide before, you should have Unity Hop already, and you have probably found the Installs tab which is where you can install new versions of Unity. And it's possible to have as many different versions as you want. Uh, one important thing here is you don't really update Unity. Instead, what you do is you add a new version, and then you can delete the old version. Uh, 
So that can be a bit of a hassle, but that's how it's supposed to be done. Uh, and the most important tab here really is the projects tab. This is where all the games you've made will show up. Uh, and if you want to create a new game, you click the new. If you have one that you have got somewhere on your computer, for example, if someone share one with you, you can use the add and, and browse to it. Um, if you want to use a specific version of Unity, you can click the arrow and choose. Um, so in order to create a new project uh, with the version of Unity we're using today, I can click here and choose 2020.3. And you'll get this create new project dialog. Uh, and here you can choose a name, you can choose where to save it, and then you can choose what type of project it is. I'm going to be doing a 3D project today, um, which is the standard project in Unity. Uh, of course, if you want to do 2D, you can choose that. These two are uh, also 3D projects, but they use a different kind of rendering. Uh, we're not going to get into detail with that today, but all of these are ones that you have to download to use them. Uh, and therefore very specific things, like if you're doing a VR project or something like that. And some of them are for uh, sample projects that are used in tutorials. Uh, so for example, this is a tutorial for making an FPS game. Um, so yeah, we're just going to be using 3D. Um, yeah, and then you cr click create. However, that takes a while. So I've done that already and I have a project like right here. Uh, so this is what opens up when you click to create, um, or at least something like this. Uh, so um, what we have here is a number of windows. And uh, you can change the, how this looks. Uh, so you can make some windows bigger or smaller, however you want. You can take some of them out and decide you don't want that to be uh, over there, you can click it in uh, however you want. Um, yeah, and you can even take it out and just have it be its own window. There we go. Uh, and drag it around however you want. Uh, it's also possible to use a, one of a number of default layouts by clicking in the corner up here where it says layout and choosing one of the default ones. I like the one that's called tall. So that's the one I'll be using today. But all of this doesn't really uh, influence your project per se. Uh, so you can just choose what, whatever wor one works for your workflow um, and just make it look the way you like, like it. <clears throat> uh, now, all of these windows, uh, let's just go through them one by one. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at is the scene. Uh, if you're from a 3D background, this may look kind of familiar. Uh, what we have here is a look into a 3D world. And a scene in Unity is kind of like a level. Uh, it's, it's where you set something up that is uh, a thing. So for example, a main menu or level one uh, or something like that. Uh, you set that up as a scene and then when you go from the main menu to level one, you change the scene. Uh, and this is then the world. And we can see right now what's in the world is uh, some light and a camera. Uh, and we can also see that in another window, and that is the hierarchy. And the hierarchy is uh, basically just a list of all the things that are in the scene. Uh, so sometimes when you start building up your world, it can be really hard to find stuff over here in the scene. Then it's easier to find it in the hierarchy. Um, and yeah, we can just see right now, uh, we only have this light and the camera. These are not really things that we can see in the game. Uh, so let's try and add some a, a new thing into our scene. I can do that by right-clicking in the hierarchy or, or clicking the plus up here. And then down here, we have the, uh, the objects we can add. And I would like to add something I can actually see within my game. So that would be a 3D object. And here you can see we have the, some standard shapes I can put in. So let's just add a cube. And like that, and we can see it's here. 
Uh, yeah. And when I have this object in here, uh, you can see now there are these arrows. Uh, and these arrows are tools for manipulating where this object is in the world. So this is the move tool that I can use to move the object around. Again, if you've been in a 3D modeling tool, you're probably familiar with the uh, tools like this. Uh, you can also just move it, in, for example, if I want to just move it in the uh, yeah, horizontal plane, I can grab this and then I can't move it up, but I can move it in the other two directions. Uh, now, this is not the only tool we have. Uh, you can see all the tools that are available up here. Uh, the first one is the hand tool. That's just for dragging around, so I can change what I'm looking at in the world. You can also, if I'm at the move tool, I can hold Control and Alt at the same time, and then I can drag around with my mouse. Uh, or I can use the shortcut keys, so all of the tools have uh, shortcuts. So the first one is Q, uh, move tool is W, next one is E, and so on until Y. Uh, so after the move tool, we have the rotate tool for rotating the object. Uh, again, you can choose which axis to rotate it on. Uh, after that, we have the scale tool for making the object bigger. Uh, and here, a useful tool is the box in the middle can be used to scale it uniformly. So it just becomes bigger or smaller uh, without changing the aspect ratio. Uh, the next tool we're not going to be using today uh, because this is the rec tool. It's used for uh, manipulating sprites, which is for 2D games. Uh, hence, we don't use it for a 3D object like the cube. And finally, we have the uh, well, the universal tool where we can do pretty much a little bit of everything at once. So I can move, I can rotate, and I can scale uh, uniformly. Um, yeah. So those are the tools for how we can move our objects around in the world. Uh, now there is another tool that can be useful. Uh, and that is actually probably one of the biggest upsides of using a game engine like Unity. Uh, and that is that we can always see what our game looks like right now. Uh, and well, one way we can try and get this effect is if I actually select the camera, uh, either by selecting it like this or clicking over here, you can actually see what the camera is seeing right here. Uh, but that's not necessarily everything that of how our game actually looks. Uh, this is just what this camera sees. It is possible to have multiple cameras and maybe have something that gets drawn directly on the screen, uh, a UI. Uh, so in order to actually see what the whole game looks like right now, we can go to the game tab. Uh, and we can see this is our game right now. Uh, and the thing about Unity is when you create a project, it's actually already a game that can be played. Uh, there's just not really anything in the game. Uh, but I can try to play it right now by using the play button up here. So these are our uh, yeah, our play tools. And just like this, I can actually play the game. And there we go. This is my great game right now. So nothing is happening, uh, but it works, it runs. Uh, and that's something that can be really good to, to check continuously that when you change something, does my game actually still work? Uh, and you can do that very easily like this. And of course, when you start adding functionality, it's really useful to see does that functionality actually still work? Uh, and if it's adding a 3D model, then it can be, does this model, this animation, or so, uh, whatever it is, does it look right in the game? Uh, now, the other buttons here are, uh, First off, pause. So that just pauses the game, uh, which could be useful if you have something where you want to see in a jump, and then you want to pause the game to see what it actually looks like. Looks like. Uh, and it is possible to go back to the scene and uh, look around uh, to see the different parts of the game while you're paused. 
now maybe I don't want to look at it like this. Uh, in that case, I can change the uh, where I'm looking from by using the tool up here. Uh, so if I want to see it from the top, I can click here, uh, and then I'm looking down on it from the front uh, and from the right. Uh, you can also change to autographic view if you prefer that. It's mainly useful if you're making 2D games, I think. Uh, but it, you can change from perspective to autographic like that. Uh, you can also rotate uh, by just using your mouse by holding Alt and then dragging with your mouse. That way you're rotating around whatever it is you're looking at. Uh, so it can be useful to focus on something like the cube here, for example. And then you can use this, the mouse wheel to zoom in and out uh, and then rotate around it. It is also possible to use your arrow keys to move around in the world if you prefer that. Uh, yeah, so that was pause. The last button here is if you're looking for something very specific. Uh, maybe you want to see what something looks like exactly at the point where the player touches the ground again then it's possible to use the step to go through the game one frame at a time. Uh, now, if I stop this, it's also possible to pause and then play. That will start the game and then immediately pause it. Now, one thing that's really important uh, when you're in play mode like this is to notice that uh, it's actually possible to change things while you're in play mode. So I can move this, for example, uh, and you can think of this uh, sometimes it can be useful for almost like cheat codes. You can move things around to get a situation you want and then continue playing. Uh, and that works just fine. However, uh, now I've moved this cube, but as soon as I stop playing, it's back to where it was. Uh, so changes that you make while you're playing are not going to be saved. Um, and it makes sense, of course, if the player is moving around when you stop playing, it should move back to how it was in the beginning. Uh, but it can be a problem if you forget that you're in play mode and then you start making changes and working. Uh, all of that is going to be lost when you then stop playing. Uh, and that's actually why I have this orange tint uh, in play mode. I'll show you a little later how you can set that up if you want to have that. But that's just to remind me that I'm in play mode so I don't start working on something uh, and then uh, yeah, and then lose it when I stop playing. Uh, now, the next window we are going to be looking at is the inspector. Uh, so that's the window we have over here. And you probably already noticed that we get information about whatever we have selected over here. Uh, so if I select the cube I have here, uh, at the top, we have some basic information about uh, the object that we have selected. So for example, the name, and you can change that to whatever you like. Uh, the other one that's really important up here is this little check mark here. Uh, that's whether this object is active or not. Uh, so if you deselect that, the object disappears. Uh, but it's not deleted. It's really easy to get it back. Uh, but it's not going to be doing anything in your game. Uh, so it can be useful for having an object that's not supposed to do something for a while, and then you can just activate it at a later point and then it'll, it'll be there. Um, now, everything that's below down here uh, is a list of components. Uh, and components are what builds up a game object. Uh, so basically the components are what makes our cube a cube. Uh, and each game object is defined by the components that are on it. Uh, now, the first one here really is the most important one, uh, the transform, uh, because that's the only component that all game objects has have. Uh, and the transform is the component that describes where the uh, object is in the world. Uh, so you can see it describes the position, where is it in the world, the rotation, how is it rotated, and the scale, how big is it. Uh, so all game objects ha have this, uh, but the rest of it, that depends on what kind of game object it is. So you can see here, we have these three uh, components. If I go to a camera, it has a different component. Uh, 
yeah, I'm going to go into detail with exactly what these components do a little later. Um, but yeah, that, that's the important part that they're really what defines the, the game object and the transform is super important to know. Uh, now, going back to our hierarchy, we can do a, a couple other things here as well. Uh, if you start building up your world, this hierarchy can become quite messy. Uh, so sometimes it can be nice to be able to group objects together within the um, within the hierarchy. So for example, I might want to say that the main camera and directional light, that's something, uh, those are kind of default objects that are in all of my scenes. Then I can create a new game object. This time I'm going to create an empty and an empty game object just, just means that it's an, a game object with no components. Uh, so you can see it only has the transform component. Uh, I can just call this default objects. And what I can do now is I can take these two and group them together under default objects. Uh, what this is, does is it, it's parenting. So we say these two have become ch children of default objects. Uh, and it can be useful just for this, for grouping things, kind of think of it like a folder uh, so I can hide it away. But it can also be useful if I have this cube, for example, and now I decide that it should have a smaller cube on top. Um, I can create a, oh, let's just create another cube. Um, and let's call this one a head. So if I go to my scene, you can see right now it's really small compared to the bigger cube. But if I just put it up here, uh, well, let's just move this one back to zero. So now it's on top. Uh, but if I want to actually think of this as one object, like maybe this is a robot of, of some kind, uh, then if I call this one robot, I want to think of this as one object. Uh, but right now, if I'm moving the robot, the head doesn't follow. But if I make the head a child of the robot, when I move the robot, the child follows. So that way you can have multiple objects, but make them act like one object. Uh, however, uh, there is one thing that's really important to notice uh, when you have child objects. So if I just make this one not a child again, and you have a look at the transform with the position and the scale, when I then make it a child, you'll notice all of these values change. Uh, and that's because when we have a object that is a child of another object, uh, it is going to use what we call relative values. And that means uh, before when the head is not a child, its position, for example, is relative to the world center. Uh, so right now we can see it is three and a half meters above the world center because the world center is somewhere down here. When I make it a child of the robot, instead it says where it is compared to uh, the center of the robot. Uh, so that's why the values change. But we can actually see the scale also change changes, and that's because it also says how big it is compared to the robot. Uh, so even though this is one by one by one meter, the head, because the robot is much bigger than that, we get values that are smaller than one. Uh, and we can also see Actually, this the set value, for example, uh, went from, or no, sorry, the y went from three and a half uh, to just zero point six, uh, and that's because it's also not saying that it's zero point six meters above the center of the robot. It's saying that it is uh, zero point six of uh, the robot's height above the center of the robot. Uh, So the, the scale of the robot also defines how the, what the numbers for the position of the head is going to be. Uh, so yeah, that's just something that's important to remember that these values are not going to be in meters, for example, when you're actually looking at a child object. Uh, and therefore it can often be easier to place the object first and then make it a child. Uh, yeah, so. That was it for parenting. Uh, oh yeah, just another detail. You can make a, as deep hierarchies as you want. So I can add another object like a grandchild under head and so on. 
as many as you want. Now, the last window we have here that we're going to have a look at is the project window, the one we have down here. And the project window is really just a folder where you have all the files that are in your project. Uh, so right now you can see uh, we have the assets. So that's the, the folder that has all of your files. And in it, there's just one, one folder, scenes. Uh, and if I go into that, I can see there is a single file, sample scene. And that's actually the one I'm in right now. Uh, so that's the only file that is in my game right now. It's just this one scene. Uh, but as you start to add 3D models, sound, scripts, all of that, it's also going to be down here. Uh, now, there are a few other things. Uh, for example, up here, uh, there are quick searches. So that's just to find all of your 3D models. For example, you could click here. Uh, and then it will show all the models that are in the assets folder. Uh, now, there is also this package folder. Uh, that's just all the uh, stuff that Unity has uh, made available to the project. Uh, but that's not really important for us right now, because all the files we're going to be working with are going to be in the assets folder. Uh, now, if you don't like this way of looking at it, you can also get a more standard file explorer look uh, by clicking up here and choosing one column layout. Uh, so again, that's up to you, what you prefer. Uh, now I'm going to try and import uh, another file. So in this case, it's going to be a texture. Uh, so I have another file in my project. Uh, so first I'm going to create a folder for it by right clicking on assets, saying create folder and uh, calling it textures. And I can open this. Uh, and now I'm going to add uh, the file. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that is just, I have the file in a folder here, just completely standard Windows folder. Uh, and I can just drag it from here and into Unity to where I want it and release. And there, it's imported. This file has now been copied into my project and it is ready to be used. Uh, now, uh, when we add a, an asset like this, I can click it. And again, the inspector will show some uh, information. But unlike when it was game objects, there are no components this time. Instead, what we have uh, are the import settings. And these are settings that depends on what kind of file it is. So in this case, it, case it's an image. And therefore, I'm getting these uh, texture import settings. And well, for some of it, you may know more about this than I do, uh, since you're the artist. Uh, so I'm not uh, an expert on what all of these things necessarily mean. Uh, but the, probably the most important one is the texture type. That's where you tell what, what kind of things you want to be able to do with this file. So right now, it's a default texture, which means it can be used as a texture on a 3D object. Uh, if, for example, instead you want to use it for a 2D thing uh, as a sprite, then you need to change it and tell it that this is a sprite. Uh, so when when you change it, it's also going to change all of the other settings that you have. Uh, so for example, you can say whether this is a single sprite or a sprite sheet. Uh, but in this case, I actually do want to just have the pink one be a texture. So I'll change it back to default. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, the other thing that can be good to know is down here, that's all about uh, compression. So if you have really big files uh, and you add them in here, they will automatically be compressed. Uh, so if you have something that looks like it's not as good quality as you want it, you might want to look if uh, you need to allow it to have more uh, space after it's been compressed. And if you do change anything, it's important. It, it doesn't actually change anything immediately, not until it's actually been applied. So if I change this uh, to a sprite, just to show what I mean, uh, if I then try to go up, it'll say this hasn't actually changed yet. You need to apply it. And you can either go out and click apply, or you can just click apply down here. Uh, and then it would actually change it. Um, 
but let's just change this back to a texture there. So those are the two ways you can apply changes. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody's asking questions. Uh, I hope maybe Hannibal can yeah. speak up if, uh, if there are any questions. Yes, so um, there have been a few questions and uh, maybe we should have talked about that in the beginning, how we, how we take questions. Um, do you want to finish your your walkthrough and then we can take questions or do you want to? Uh, we can take some questions now. Yeah. So the first question I think was uh, in actually all the way back in the Unity Hub maybe um, okay. or either in the Unity Hub or it was in the scene view. So the question is, what's the different big differences uh, in working with 2D versus 3D from the perspective of an artist? And I'm not sure if that's from the new project menu or if it's from the in the in the sort of scene view yeah uh from the perspective of an artist well now i'm not an art artist i should maybe uh, start by saying that i'm a programmer uh but well the the main difference would probably be that if you're working in a 3d game then you have 3d objects like this where most of the stuff uh, artists are probably going to be doing are textures so uh, unwraps of different models that uh yeah that that you're drawing uh and of course 3d models as well but i think it's pretty obvious you're not going to be needing 3d models in a 2d game uh whereas if you're in a 2d game then you're going to be making sprites uh, is the is the sort of workflow pretty like the, the 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 unity project view is pretty much the same for the two if you if you make a 2d project rather than yes, a 3d project pr pretty much uh, yeah. yeah so Pretty much if you're making a 2D game instead, what you would usually do is just uh, change it so you're looking like this and you're not doing perspective. And uh, then instead of 3D models, you would just be adding flat sprites. Um, so you would be uh, importing, instead of importing your images as textures, as I showed, you would be importing them as sprites. Uh, and sprites is just a different kind of uh, object. Uh, so when I added a 3D object here, uh, it's also, well, oh, actually it doesn't have 2D object anymore. It used to have 2D objects here as well. Uh, maybe that's because I created this as a 3D project. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. Maybe we can uh, look at that in the break and see if there's an interesting distinction there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, of course there, there's, a huge difference in making textures versus sprites uh, but actually importing the files into unity is not much of a difference you just have to tell it that it's a sprite okay any other questions um there was just a question are, are you are every, is everyone supposed to follow what you're doing and what you're creating um and do we need to have some special assets that you have uh no not really uh yeah, so I'm I'm just going to be going through this. I'm not really sure people will have time to follow it yeah. uh, necessarily. I think yeah. there's no more questions for now. Uh, you can use any texture, any pic picture, if you want to try to import uh, a texture. You don't have to have this specific penguin image. <laughs> yeah, and Unity recognizes a a number of uh, of image formats. Uh, I usually use PNG. Uh, just because that works for pretty much everything and also has transparency. Cool. That's all. Okay. Uh, in that case, we're going to move on. Uh, so there are still a couple things that we haven't talked about here. Uh, and the first one is the menu line. Uh, you're probably familiar with this if you have used pretty much any Windows program ever. Uh, and it works kind of similarly. Uh, so file is mainly used for uh, saving stuff. Uh, so you can save the scene, you can save the whole project. Uh, if you want to use new project and open project, this is just going to use open the Unity Hub. So you might as well just use open the Unity Hub yourself, uh, since that is how you're going to be handling whole projects. Uh, and then it can be useful for creating a new scene, uh, which you can, you can do here. You can also open the scene, but both of these, uh, you can do it here, or you can just go into your project window. Uh, so if you want to open a scene, 
you can just find the scene here and double click it and that'll open it. Of course, right now I'm already in the sample scene, so not much is going to happen. Uh, and if you want to create a new scene, you can also do that uh, in the project window if you prefer by right clicking down here. Uh, so this is the other way we can create assets. Uh, we can either import it or we can create new ones uh, by right-clicking, create, and in this case, I wanted a scene. So I select scene and I give it a name. And then we'll see, this is just an empty scene like, uh, like the sample scene was when I first started with that one. Uh, and the last thing that can be important here in the file is the build settings, which is when you want to build and actually get your game out of Unity. Uh, and I'm going to be going through that at the end of the session. Uh, the second one is edit. Uh, if you've used a program like Word or anything like that, uh, it's actually fairly similar. You can select stuff like all of uh, all the game objects in the scene. You can copy paste uh, or duplicate stuff. Uh, but all of this, Generally, you pretty quickly will get, uh, get the hang of just using shortcuts for it. Uh, control C, Control V is a uh, tried and true standard. Uh, if you want to rename, you can use F2. If you want to delete, you can use the delete key. Uh, probably the most important thing that you actually have to go to the edit to do is to find the project settings and preferences. Uh, and the project settings are for settings that change the uh, things in general for your game. So it's not about a single game object or a single scene, it's for everything in the game. Uh, so for example, what is the, the game called? Uh, what your your company called? Uh, what should be the icon that's actually shown uh, when you enter or yeah, the, the icon for the game, uh, either on the computer or uh, on your phone, whatever you're building for. Uh, it can also be stuff like physics, for example, if you decide that in your game, uh, gravity is not going to be down, uh, then you can change on the physics, the gravity and say, now uh, gravity in my game is going to have things fall up instead. So that's a setting that's for the whole game and not just a single scene. Uh, then you change it in the uh, project settings. And product settings, again, is just an, a window. So you can drag it in and place it anywhere you want, or you can just close it when you're done with whatever you're doing. Uh, the other one is preferences. So this is to do with the uh, things you have, or this has to do with the editor. So if you have some settings for the editor you want to change, then this is the place to go. Uh, for example, if you want to change which program you're using for different files, for example, I suppose, uh, for some of you, uh, how you open images from Unity might be important, then you can change that here uh, and just say, use whatever is the standard for Windows or Photoshop uh, or whatever you want. Um, and this is also where we can change uh, under colors. The thing that I showed earlier, where when I enter play mode, I get a tint that reminds me that I'm in play mode, that's here with play mode tint, you can change that to whatever you want. Uh, yeah, just so you also have that reminder. Uh, now, uh, there was, uh, oh yeah, on the scene view, there are a few settings I like to change as well. Uh, so this create objects at origin is another thing that can be, at least I find nice to, to, to enable. Uh, and that will basically make it so that when you create new objects in your scene, they're going to be created uh, in 000, zero, zero uh, rather than wherever you're looking. Uh, and I prefer to have that on. Uh, yeah. So those are all the settings you can find here. Uh, the next one is assets. Uh, well, here it's possible to import assets uh, by just browsing to them, and then they'll be added to the assets folder. Uh, however, as I showed, it it's usually easier to just find it in your uh, file view and just drag it into Unity. Uh, so what we usually use it for is just uh, the packages. 
it's possible to import packages. So if you find someone who has made a a package of files for Unity somewhere online, for example, uh, and they you download that package, then you can import it here, and it will uh, then take all the files that are in the package and add them to your assets view. Uh, then we have the game object view or uh, tab here. And that's basically just uh, the same thing as when you right click over here in hierarchy. Uh, so you can add uh, new objects. Uh, and similarly, component is just for adding a component to uh, the, an object, a game object you have selected. Uh, so uh, if I want to add another collider to this, I could do that up here by going to component physics and choosing one of the colliders. Uh, it's also possible if you don't want to go up here, uh, it's possible to just select it and find the add component button down here. Uh, it can do kind of the same thing where you select uh, whatever uh, kind of object you want, uh, or if you know exactly what it's called, then you can just search for it here. So again, if I want to add a collider, I can just search for collider and I get all of the types of colliders we have here. Uh, yeah, uh, and well, it's it's important to know the difference between these uh, game objects and components uh, because for a lot of it, it's actually possible to find the same things. So, for example, if I want a light, uh, I can create different kinds of light, like a directional light. Uh, you may already know the difference for, between these. It's kind of similar to other programs. Directional light, it's is parallel light, like we know from sunlight in the real world. Point light is like a light bulb, a uh, light that comes from a specific source. Spotlight is like a flashlight and area light is like uh, a uh, ambient light in a, in a uh, defined area. Uh, but it's also possible to, because what, what we would actually get if, if we choose one of these, uh, so a directional light would create a light like this, but actually it's just a game object with a light component. So it's also possible to add light as a component. Uh, if we find it somewhere here, so rendering, uh, it's possible to just add a light. Uh, so game object, all of these are really just easy ways to to create uh, objects that already have a set of components to to do a specific thing. Uh, whereas it's also possible to make your game objects do the things by adding the right components. Uh, yeah. Uh, so moving on to the next one, it's Windows. This is for uh, creating new windows. If, for example, I accidentally close my hierarchy uh, tab uh, and I want it back, I can go to Window and select General Hierarchy, and then I can just drag it back to where I want it. Uh, it's also possible to add a, a window by right-clicking and saying add tab, um, if I want another inspector, I can do it like that. Uh, and then drag it around as I want, of course. Uh, yeah, and as you can probably see, there are a lot more windows than just the ones that I, I already have open. Uh, so there are some for, if you have really specific things, uh, some of usually, they will also open automatically when you start working with something. So once we start uh, working with animation, for example, uh, the uh, animation window will open automatically. Uh, but this is where you can find all of them. Uh, then we have help. That's just if you need some information about Unity, then you can find it here. Uh, but it's not part of your normal workflow. Uh, a couple of things that can be important are the Unity manual and scripting reference, where you can find information about how uh, Unity works and how you can do stuff. Uh, the scripting reference, of course, is mostly about code, whereas the manual is uh, mainly about how to set stuff up in your scenes. Uh, so that's the, the menu line. Uh, now, one more line that can be important is the line down here. Right now, there's nothing here. Uh, but if you ever have an error, like if something goes wrong while you're playing or if something goes wrong when you're trying to import an object, it will show up down here. Uh, and if you then click it, uh, it will open a, a console that shows the whole message. Uh, we can also open the console up here in 
general console. And it just looks like this, uh, where we will have all the messages here. And if we select one of them, we get the full message down here. Um, and it's possible to filter. So I can say that I uh, only want to see messages, warnings, or errors. Uh, you can clear the console and just get rid of all the messages that are here. Uh, error on pause can be useful if you if you want when you're trying to play the game. If an error happens, you want to pause immediately to see what caused the error. Uh, that will happen automatically if you have error pause enabled. Uh, and collapse is just if you have a lot of the same message, collapse will make it only look like one message that just says that it's been there a hundred times, for example. Uh, yeah, so let's just put that up here. Um, yeah, so that was the window and help. And I think now it is time for a 10 minute break. So I'll see you back here at five minutes past one. Awesome, thank you, Nicola. Yes, we'll be back five minutes past one. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, absolutely feel free to write into the chat.
uh, it's five minutes past one, so let's get started again. Uh, we've had a couple of questions uh, in the break. I think we got an answer for the license thing. Uh, just in case anyone was wondering, uh, you go up here to handle your uh, uh, your account. And if you're not signed in, then you can do that. And then you can click manage license and uh, you can create a personal license if you don't have one already. Uh, then there is something about lights. Uh, can a light created through window rendering have the same characteristics as light created through game objects? Uh, so game objects and components create these, uh, well, objects that create that, that dynamic lighting. Uh, they can also be used for static lighting, uh, where you bake the lighting. Uh, rather than finding out where shadow should be as you go along. Uh, by, but by default, these are going to be dynamic uh, lighting and shadows. Uh, if you go to window and rendering, there you can get some tools for lighting, uh, but these are mainly for uh, static lighting. Um, so the dynamic lighting is going to just work if you just add in the, the game objects and components. Uh, now. Moving on, uh, we are going to be creating a new game object. Uh, and I'm just going to go to the second scene. So we have a clean scene to work with. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be creating a small tank here. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to need for that is, again, I'll create a box. So I click up here, 3D object, cube. And I'll just call it tank. Uh, now, as I create this cube, again, we can see it's just a one by one by one white cube. But uh, it is this one by one by one cube because of the components that are on there. So let's have a look at them. The first one is, well, it's called cube. Uh, we can see it's a mesh filter. Uh, and what that actually means is it's just something to hold a mesh, so a 3D model of some kind. Uh, and that mesh is called cube. Um, so this is the one that gives it the shape that it has. Uh, the next component that we see is a mesh renderer. So that's the one that actually draws the mesh uh, so we can see it. Uh, and you can actually see that some components have this little check mark. These are the components that do something. So this one, for example, is just a component that holds some information but this one actually does something. Uh, and that's because you can enable and disable these components. So if I disable the renderer, it no longer draws the, the cube. Um, and then under the components, you then have the information or the settings for that component. So for example, you can define how this renderer interacts with lighting uh, and whether it should receive lighting or receive shadows and so on. Uh, so these two together makes it so that we can actually see the cube uh, here. The last component that we have is the box collider. So uh, this is the object or the component that actually makes it so that it's possible to touch this, uh, this game object. So if there wasn't a collider, uh, then this would be like an object that we could only see but not touch, uh, like a background image or a cloud in Mario or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, on the collider, it's possible to change it. So right now, the box collider is just the same exact shape as the box we see. It is possible to change that. So if you want to have that, uh, you can actually uh, touch it a little before it looks like you touch it, then you could make it a bit bigger or something like that. Uh, it can also be important uh, because this touching part is also, if it's supposed to stand on something, then that's also the collider because it, otherwise it would just fall through everything because it can't touch anything. Um, and the last important part here is the is trigger check mark on the collider. Uh, and if you make it a trigger, then that changes it from a collider to a trigger. And a trigger is actually something you can't touch. So uh, a trigger will also just fall through things, for example, uh, just like if there wasn't a collider, but it will still 
see that it touched something. Uh, so it will fall through the floor, but it will find out that it touched the floor, uh, which can be important if you're uh, inside the code. It's uh, it's useful for stuff like if you want to have a uh, a zone where when the end of player is there, it should save. So like a checkpoint zone, uh, then you can have uh, just it that could be a, an invisible box with a trigger on it. Uh, so you know when the player enters the trigger, uh, but it's not like it should be a wall that he can't walk through. Uh, yeah. Uh, so these are the, the components that are on here right now. Uh, this last one it is not actually a component. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but yeah, anything you want this op game object to be able to do, uh, you need to add components for it. Uh, and that also means if you have a programmer or if you create your own scripts, they will also need to be added as components here uh, in order to do something with this game object. Uh, so for example, if you have a, a script that makes it so that you can control this uh, cube with uh, arrow keys or something like that, then you add that script as a component. Uh, now, uh, this last one is, as I said, not a component. It's something rather special uh, because this is the material. Uh, and actually it's uh, bound to this renderer. So we'll actually be able to see right here, it says it's the default material. If I open up the materials, I can see that's actually the only material that is in this list of materials on the mesh renderer. And a material in Unity is something that defines what a thing looks like. Uh, so, uh, this default material is actually what makes the box white, for example, uh, what makes it able to have shadows on this side and uh, be white on this side. Uh, so if we were to change anything in the material, it would change what the box looks like. Uh, so let's try and do that. Uh, now, if you click the arrow here, uh, we should be able to see all the information about this material. But as you can see, it's all grayed out uh, and I can't actually change anything here. And the reason for that is that this is the default material. So this is just something that Unity has created for us and thrown on the object when we created it as, at first to just make it white uh, so that we can draw it somehow uh, because we can't draw something if there isn't a material for it. Uh, actually, if we were to try and ch not have a material on this at all, uh, we can see then it just becomes pink. And that's Unity's way of saying something's wrong here. I don't know how to draw this. Uh, so let's just control C that. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is create a new material uh, that I can actually define how I want this object to look. So I'm going to create a new folder first. Create folder, materials. And just like with scenes, materials are uh, files that we can just create within Unity. So I don't have to import anything. I can just go create new material. And let's call this one the tank material. Uh, and now it's a file down here, but it's not actually going to do anything. First, I have to apply it. And I can apply a material to an object just by dragging it onto it like this. Uh, it, however, it's only going to work with objects that have a renderer. So if I try to drag it onto the directional light, it's going to say I can't do that because directional lights don't have renderers but onto the tank. Uh, and now we'll actually be able to see that the mesh renderer now says that it's using the tank material. And it also says that down here. Uh, and now if I actually change something down here, uh, we can see it's still just white. So nothing much, much has changed here. Uh, and that's because when we create a new material, it's just the same default material uh, as the one that was used before. Uh, but now I can change it. So for example, if I want to change the, the color, of uh, of the tank here, uh, then I can find the field that's called albedo. And albedo, if you're not familiar with the, the term, uh, I know it from physics, but it's basically just which color we see an object as. Uh, so if I change the color here, uh, I should get a color picker. There it is. Uh, and make this blue, then we can see the, uh, the tank change color as well. Uh, so there's the color here. If you want to use an image, uh, well, there are actually two ways to do that. 
Um, one would be to uh, have the image. So say I wanted to actually have penguins on the tank here. Uh, then what I can do is I can just take the image uh, or the texture and drag it onto tank. And what happens then is Unity automatically creates a new material. So if I go into materials, I can now see it has created pink penguin material or ping V. Uh, and it now draws penguins on the box. Uh, so that's one way. The other way to do it, uh, if I just use the tank material again, uh, is here. You can actually see the little image or the little field here. That's for an image. So if I click here, I can select among the, the textures I have. Uh, so there are some default textures from Unity, and then there's uh, the one I imported earlier. Uh, and if I select that, then it's drawn on here, uh, tinted by the color that I selected. Um, and if I don't want an image, I can go back to none. Um, There are a lot of other things we can do with this uh, default material uh, because this has kind of been created to do a lot of the standard stuff you would want to do when uh, drawing your game objects. Uh, so you can change what the surface of it actually looks like with normal maps and height maps. Uh, you can change how metallic it looks if you want to have specular highlights and stuff like that. Uh, it's also possible to have emissions so it actually looks like it's sending out light. Um, and if you have uh, an image, uh, let's just put penguin back on to show how that works. Uh, and let's just put this one back to white so we can see the penguins. Uh, if you didn't have an image like this, then you can use the tiling down here. So if I wanted two by two, instead of just showing one penguin on each face, uh, I can have it show two by two. Uh, and I can then offset it if I want as well. Uh, so this is if you want a, a tiling texture on a the ground or something like that, then this is how to set it up. Um, yeah. Uh, so you can do quite a lot with this standard shader. Uh, well, let's just get this back to being blue. Uh, there we go. Uh, now, one thing we can also do is we can try and make this transparent. Uh, so one way, of course, is if I had a texture with some transparency, then I could make it be transparent just where the texture is transparent. Uh, or I can just make everything try and transparent by making the color here transparent. Um, but as you can see, even though it shows that the color should be transparent, I'm not able to see through right here. Uh, and the reason for that is, if we close this, uh, right above the albedo, we can actually see there is something called rendering mode. And right now that's set to opaque, so the opposite of transparent. Uh, so if I want to be able to have transparency in my object, I need to change the rendering mode. And there are actually three kinds of transparency here. The first one is cutout. And that one works a uh, bit weirdly for uh, transparency, because as you can see right now, it just disappeared completely. Uh, and that's because this one doesn't really make sense to use with um, with just the color because cutout is uh, just saying that either it's being drawn or it's not. So as you can see right now, it's it's saying that the cutoff is a half, which means as I go above and under a half, it's either completely drawn or not drawn at all. Uh, and it can be useful if you have like something that's supposed to look like a cutoff where a character is there, but the background is completely gone. Then you can use a cutout for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not good for this where I want it to just be kind of transparent. Uh, so uh, for that, I would use either fade or transparent. So fade, uh, if I change that, we can see now it's actually, uh, we can see through it, uh, but we can still see it. So fade goes from completely gone to completely there, uh, depending on what the alpha value is. Uh, and then the last one we have is transparent. Uh, it looks similar. We can still see through it. And uh, here it's still completely there. Uh, we can see the lines, but that's just uh, when we're in the scene. If we're actually over here, uh, we'll be see. Uh, we can't see through it at all. Uh, but as the alpha goes down, it becomes more and more transparent. But when it's completely uh, at zero, 
unlike fade, it's not uh, just gone. We can still see it. So transparent is for uh, effects like glass, where sure you can see through it, but you can still see it's there. Uh, and that's what transparent is good at. Uh, so if I just want to be able to have it uh, become completely invisible, then I should use fade. Uh, and then it just depends on the alpha value. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, just to show a one last thing we can do with uh, materials, I'm just going to create a new object. So let's create a sphere this time, just so we can tell the difference. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is create uh, something that doesn't react to light. So I'm going to call this one unlit sphere. Uh, let's just move it out so we can see it. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to create a new material for this and call it unlit. So, there. Uh, and what I want to do here is I want to actually change the way this is being drawn completely. Uh, and the way to do that is to change the shader. So right now we can see it's using the standard shader and all of these materials are. Uh, but if I change that, uh, you can see we have a bunch of other shaders uh, and that that's basically completely different ways to draw an object. Uh, so in this case, I want something unlit. Uh, and unlit just means that it, it doesn't care about the light at all. It's just whatever you put on here, that's how it's going to be drawn. Uh, so we can have uh, different. So just draw it with a color, draw it with a texture. Uh, we can have transparent, which also has a texture, but again, it, it's not opaque, so it's possible to make it uh, transparent with a alpha value. Uh, let's just go with color, and then we change the color of it. Uh, so let's just make it green. And, oh yeah, I have to apply it. There we go. And now you can see it's completely green. Uh, now the downside of, of using an unlit uh, material like this is it's really hard to see edges. It kind of just becomes this circle. And if I just for a moment put this on the tank as well, you can see I can't see the edges of the, the box either. Um, so if you have a texture that can help because then you can kind of see what uh, the different sides of it, but especially if it's just a color like this, uh, kind of just becomes a, a blob of color on your screen. Uh, but for some things, uh, it can be really useful. Uh, for example, if you have something flat, then well, it, it, it's supposed to look like that. Uh, and then if you don't want it to be affected by shadows, then an unlit material can be a good way to do that. Uh, yeah, and of course, one upside to using unlit materials are that, or is that um, it's Less or it, it's better performance. So it's not as much work for the computer because it doesn't have to handle lights. Although uh, you have to get up to a certain size of game before performance becomes an issue usually. Uh, so I think I saw there might have been some questions. Do you have any, uh, Hannibal? Um, right. Uh, actually, not uh, really. Uh, we had one, one person with a problem with the with the skybox disappearing, but we we managed to fix that. And then Flag asks uh, about the uh, you were mentioned like transparent shader, the standard shader with transparency on Neil Beto. And then he asked if that made uh, refractions. So just it sort of make a, a glass like uh, refraction effect. And I, no. I told him that you you need a special shader to b manipulate how things look behind the glass material. So we need a special glass shader for that. And yeah, uh, we're not gonna uh, probably not gonna go super deep on everything you can do with shaders, but perhaps that's an interesting topic to go like deep on for a future workshop. So I'll be adding that to the survey in the end, and then we can see if you guys want to go deep on shaders in the future. Yeah, so sounds like Hannibal answered that one. Uh, you can do a lot with shaders, uh, but it's not automatically going to have all the real physical effects of glass just because you make it transparent. Uh, you would need a lot more uh, work on the shader for that. 
But in that case, I'm just going to move on. Uh, so right now, my tank is just a blue box. Uh, so I'm going to be adding a cannon to it now. Uh, so as I showed you earlier, we can do do this by creating a child object of the tank. Uh, so in this case, the cannon should probably be a cylinder. So I'll add a 3D object cylinder. And by right clicking on the tank, when I do this, it's going to be automatically uh, made a child of the cannon. Uh, and I want it to point forward so I can look at this little gizmo uh, for the world and see that forward, that's the blue set. Uh, so I want it to point that way, uh, which means I need to rotate it 90 degrees around here. There we go. And right now it's way too big, so let's make it a bit smaller. A bit smaller. And then we need to move it forward a bit. Uh, so if I move it to 0.5, that means that the middle, so the part that I'm actually moving, will be exactly at the edge of the, the cube. Um, so that's always true if I set it to 0 0.5. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to this. Uh, yeah, I want it to be moved a little further, so I'm going to move it to 0.8, and now it looks like it's in the right position. Uh, but I want this to look the same as the uh, main body of the tank. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the same material to it. Uh, so that means they're going to be drawn the same way. And now if I make changes to the material, uh, it'll affect both of them. So if I make it not transparent anymore, both of them are going to be opaque again. Uh, yeah, and yeah, because I've made it a, uh, a child here, uh, remember if I'm going to be moving the tank around, the cannon is going to follow. So they are now one object as I want them to be. Uh, the next I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to add components to make the tank do what I want. Uh, so if this was my player, I would probably be adding some custom scripts, but I I would also have, uh, I would also want to have physics on this uh, because right now it's just standing in the middle of the air and that's not really realistic or, or what I want for my game. Uh, so I'm going to uh, make the physics affect this. So I'll add a components uh, and I'll go to physics. And we have a bunch of components in here, but most of them are either joints or controller or sorry, joints or colliders. Uh, I already have a box collider, so I don't need any of that. What I'm looking for is the rigid body. Uh, and a rigid body is something that can be affected by physics. Uh, so if I add a rigid body, we can see I can then uh, say how much does this weigh, uh, and I have different settings like should it be affected by gravity. Uh, I do want this to be affected by gravity, so I'm leaving that on. Is kinematic uh, is also quite important. That's something where you have something that is affected by physics, but only when you say it should be. Uh, so you can think of uh, trains in old GTA games, uh, which might be an old reference, but basically they moved along their tracks and you could drive a car right into the side of them and they just didn't care. They just kept driving and you could stack cars in, in front of it and they'd just drive through, not slowing down at all. Uh, because it was just, it was kinematic. It moved how it was uh, programmed to do. Uh, so you can set a speed and speed is also physics, uh, but even though you then try to throw stuff at it, it's not going to be affected by other objects. Uh, so that can be useful for certain things. Uh, and the last thing down here that's really important is the constraints, where you can say that, sure, physics can change things, like it can you can push this object and it will, will move, but only in certain directions. So for example, uh, for my tank, uh, even though you know, in the real world, of course, everything can move in every direction and rotate in every direction, but I, I have a tank here and I don't want my player to suddenly roll over or uh, or uh, yeah, do a barrel roll. So I'm going to say that it cannot rotate in X and Z uh, because rotating in the Z direction, that would be a barrel roll. Uh, yeah, and rotating the X, that would be a somersault. So I don't want either of those. 
but why I'm going to leave because that's just uh, turning the tank. So that's okay. Uh, and we can actually see now uh, that it works because now we actually have something that should happen in our game because gravity is on. So the tank should not be falling down. So let's see if that works. And it did. Uh, so it fell down. But if this was my, my player, that could actually be, be a problem right now. Uh, because if the tank can just fall down or if it starts driving and it just drives off the screen, that's not very good. Uh, so I would like the camera to follow the tank. Uh, and of course, if you want something advanced for this, then of course you, you need to start coding. Uh, but we can actually have something simple where the camera is following the tank by just making the camera a child of the tank. Because again, that's going to mean that the camera will always, uh, when we move the tank, the camera is going to move as well. Uh, so uh, if I move the tank now, we'll see the camera is going to follow. Uh, and if I rotate it, actually the same, the camera is also going to follow and always look from the back of the tank. Uh, so let's see how that looks. Now, when the tank falls, the camera follows it. Uh, although right now it is pretty difficult to, to see uh, because we can just see that this, that that's like our reference point moving up. Uh, so it's kind of hard to see if it's the tank falling down or the ball moving up. Uh, so let's create a few more objects. So uh, we actually have a world we can land in. Uh, so in order to do that, I am going to start by creating some ground. So I'll just create a, well, uh, well, let's make it a quad. Uh, we have different objects we could use here. Uh, and actually, I want the ground to be big and flat. And there are actually two things I can use for that. I can either use a plane or a quad. Uh, they're similar. They're both flat. Uh, the quad is just simpler. Uh, well, uh, many of you have probably worked with 3D programs. And a quad is just two, two triangles, where a plane is many. Uh, so if it's if you don't need many triangles, just use a quad. And there we have it. I'm going to call it ground. And if I just go here, move it down a bit. And I'm going to need to rotate it. Oh, uh, that was not the right way. And. Let's just make it 100 by 100. And uh, let's create a material for it. You might have lost a few people with uh, the the plane if people are to follow. So we might want to go back and just show the, the rotation of the plane and stuff after oh, you've done uh, the material. Yeah, sure. I'll just uh, make this a greenish color. Yeah, so uh, what I did with the, to create the ground here was just rotate the, the quad 90 degrees because it's uh, vertical when you create a quad. So by rotating it 90 degrees, I just lie flat down so it's horizontal. Uh, and yeah, then I just make it 100 by 100. Uh, so we have something to land on um, that can look like grass or something like that. Uh, yeah, and just so it's we have something so we can actually see where we are. I am going to create a few hills as well. So let's just create those as spheres. And again, down into the ground and make it bigger. And again, I'm going to create a material for it. And apply it and make it a brownish color. And I want to have multiple hills here. Uh, so I am going to duplicate this. So I can do that by just selecting it and pressing Control D. Uh, and then I can grab this uh, green plane that allows me to move it around uh, without moving it up or down. So then I can just create as many as I want here. Something like that. 
Uh, so now I actually have a world. Uh, yeah, for the tank to be in. So let's see how it works. And now it should actually uh, fall down and land on the ground. And it does. Uh, so now the tank isn't just falling forever. But if I uh, start to be able to move the tank around, of course, I don't have anything to move the tank right now. But we can see uh, that actually looks OK. But if I move too far, I'll fall off the edge. Um, and well, that wasn't really what I wanted. Uh, so if I were to make a game like this, I would probably want to create some kind of walls so that the player couldn't just drive off the edge. Uh, and that's fairly simple. I can just create some objects. So let's create a cube here, call it a wall. We'll just move that one to the edge. So I create this as 100 by 100. So the edge must be at, at uh, 50. So let's start by moving out there. Uh, and it was 100, so like that. And let's just make it 10 high. And well, something like that. And I can just create walls for all the other sides as well. So in this case, I just want it over here. So that would be minus 50. So like that. And if I want a wall up here, well, then it should probably be zero here and 50 on set instead. And it should be 100 here and one here instead. And the last wall would then be minus 50 here. Uh, now, of course, I don't want it to look like this. Uh, instead, it should just be that the uh, player can drive through the walls, but they shouldn't see the walls. So I'm going to make them invisible. And that's fairly simple. I can just remove the rendering part of the cubes. So remove component, or I could just disable it. But I know I'm not going to need it. So like that. Uh, now there isn't a renderer, so they're invisible. But they're still there, so you can't drive through them. Um, and well, then we can just make the ground bigger. So let's just make it 10 times as big. And see. There we go. But now if. Uh, if the player tried to drive just off the edge, they would only be able to drive until they hit the wall, and then they would automatically stop. Can you can you demonstrate that, or is, is it uh, is that un impossible? Uh, so I can't really demonstrate that because I don't really have any kind of movement script right now. Okay, uh, and it only works when your movement works with physics. Because yeah, and and you moved you moved the block earlier, but how did you do that? Uh, so. Earlier, when I when I moved, um, so here, uh, what I actually did was I was just changing the position. Uh, oh, not that one. So uh, you're able to drag the something. Have, yeah. So have this, we... this is basically just directly changing the position, which is like just say. How did you do that? So I'm doing that by grabbing uh, the set part of the position in the transform, and okay. then I can drag to change the position. Okay. Uh, so for all numeric values you can actually just grab it you can just grab them and then scroll them back and forth okay yeah, exactly. uh inga says my tank keeps falling through the ground uh in that case i would check if your tank uh, has the collider set as a trigger and if the ground has its collider set as a trigger does the ground come with a collider maybe inga you haven't added a collider to the ground yeah, so the, the uh, ground should have a mesh collider as standard Okay. And the tank should have a collider, and then neither of them should be trigger. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully that that uh, solves your problem, Inga. Otherwise, let us know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to the next thing. Uh, now we're going to have a look at what is called prefabs in Unity. And the idea with a prefab is uh, sometimes you have uh, an object that you want to have multiple copies of different places. So it might be an enemy, and you want 10 of the same enemy in your scene. But it might also be your player. And sure, there should only be one player in a, in a scene. But then in the next level, you want the same player uh, with the same components being able to do the same things. So a copy, but in a different scene. Uh, and you probably want that in all of your scenes, really. Uh, 
and then it can be a good thing to when you created it in one scene or in one place to just be able to create like a blueprint for this is what a player looks like and then you can just use that to create a copy in a different scene uh, and the way to do it is fairly simple uh, a prefab is going to be a file in your assets so i'm going to create a new folder called prefabs uh, yeah oh yeah and it's it stands for prefabricated game object as far as i know so let's say i want to make a prefab for my tank uh, so i can create multiple copies of my tank uh, i can do that by just taking the game object i want to make prefab and dragging it down here and it will automatically create a prefab for it uh, and now if I want to create a copy of it, uh, so let's just go down here so I can see, uh, I can just drag it up here in my hierarchy. So there we go. And let's move it up. And we can see uh, it's there as a new object. Uh, so that's one way. I can also try and just drag it out into the scene and it will place it. However, it can be pretty hard to actually make place it in a way that makes sense here uh, because what it does is it uh, it just puts it wherever your mouse touches something so here it puts it on the ground because that's the first thing that my mouse uh, is touching uh, if i just change this uh, if my mouse doesn't touch anything because here it's just sky so there's nothing for it to hit then it just places it a, spe a specific distance from the camera uh, so maybe it makes sense if you're trying to place like a tree or something that should be on the ground. Uh, but otherwise I find it's usually easier to just put it in the hierarchy and then place it where I want it afterwards. Uh, but yeah, I can place it like that. Uh, and now I have three tanks in my hierarchy. Uh, but what's, What's smart about these prefabs is if we look into the hierarchy, we can see these are no longer just normal game objects uh, because they've been colored blue and they have this blue box instead of just a white one. Uh, and that's because they are what is known as instances of the prefab. Uh, and what that means is basically just that this game object knows that it is a copy of the prefab that we have down here. Um, and we can actually see that if we click on one of them, we can see that it says it's a prefab and we can select the prefab or open the prefab. Uh, so selecting it will just select the file we have down here and opening it will do the same as opening the prefab from the asset menu, which we can do by clicking here or double clicking on it. Uh, and what that does is it opens the prefab in its own little world here. Uh, so we can change the prefab. Uh, and this is where it gets really uh, clever to actually use prefabs when you have multiple uh, instances of the same object. Uh, because let's say I want, I, I decide I want to change something to my uh, tank. So maybe I want to have a bigger cannon. Uh, so I'm going to make this a bit bigger like that uh, and save. Now, when I go back, uh, if I have a look at the three tanks I have here, they all have bigger cannons. Um, so this can be a really good way to uh, change it from all the objects that should be the same. So for example, if it's a player that you have in 10 different scenes, then by changing a prefab, you can change all, all 10 different players. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, now, one thing that can be important here is if I actually enter play mode and I have a look at the tanks, uh, let's just go here. Uh, if I look over here, I can see they're actually no longer blue. Uh, and that's because when you enter play mode, they no longer have that uh, same connection to the prefab. And that means if I go in and change the prefab now, and for example, decide that the camera should actually be closer. It's a little bit too far away from the tank. Uh, so like that and save and go out. Then we can actually see that uh, did not change anything here. But as soon as I stop the game, we can see the camera actually moved closer. So um, changing something to a prefab doesn't immediately 
uh, change anything for the game objects if you're in play mode. But on the other hand, changes to a prefab are saved even though you're in play mode. So earlier I said that changes you make while you're in uh, play mode are not saved. But for prefabs, that not, that's not true. It's only for the changes you make up on your game objects that are actually in your scene. Those won't be changed. Uh, but if you ch change anything in a prefab, uh, it, because it's a file down here, it gets saved immediately. And even after you stop playing, it's still changed. Uh, yeah, uh, there are other ways to change your prefabs. Uh, so for example, it can be quite tricky if you just open a prefab because you see it in this world of its own especially if it's a child of another game object or something like that, uh, you're seeing it out of context. Um, and it can actually be pretty hard to see how exactly does, does it look right what I'm changing right now. What you can do there is you can choose one of the one that is in context. So for example, this tank is the tank that I had from the beginning. Uh, it's in my world. So I can see how big it is compared to the world and stuff like that. Uh, and if I click open here, I'll actually, again, uh, open it in the prefab uh, uh, editing mode, but now I'm seeing it in context. So I'm seeing it in the world, the world is just grayed out. Uh, so now I can, again, change something to the prefab. So maybe I'm moving the camera even closer here. Uh, and I can actually still see what the main camera sees as the world view. Uh, and once I go back, if I save this and go back, we can now see it's uh, again been changed to all of the tanks uh, because I still changed the prefab. I was just seeing it in context. Um, now, if you decide that, uh, for example, the tank down here, if I just move this up a bit. Uh, now, if I decide that this tank should actually be special, uh, it, its cannon should be placed a bit differently. Uh, and be more on top of uh, of the box like that, then that's possible. Uh, and as you can see, that did not change the other tanks. Uh, what we have here is what's known as an override. So this tank is still uh, a prefab. So if I were to change something like the size of the cannon again, um, let's just try and do that. Uh, and Maybe this one is not quite as long anymore. And save and go back. We can see this one got shorter again. So changes to the prefab still happen. But uh, the, we're just saying that the cannon for this one tank should be moved. And that also means that if I were to go and move the cannon in the prefab, it wouldn't move this cannon because I've said that this specific tank, uh, the cannon should be right here, even if the prefab starts saying something else, uh, at least for the Y position, because that's what I've changed. Uh, now, if I decide that actually all of my tanks should look like this, that's also possible. Um, or if I decide that this was actually a bad idea, it shouldn't look like this. Uh, I can choose the tank here and uh, I can go uh, here to the cannon and find the thing I've changed. So in this case, this position, and I can right click on it. And there are two options. I can either say apply to prefab tank. That would mean that I'm saying that this is what all tanks should look like from now on, uh, and it changes to prefab. Or I can say revert and say, no, I want this to go back to what the prefab looked like. Uh, so let's just revert it and say, no, actually, this should just go back to looking like the prefab. And save. Uh, yeah. Uh, now I'm just going to remove the two new tanks. So we only have one tank in the scene. There we go. And save. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, right. The next thing I'm going to show is just uh, it's possible to create. Uh, prefabs of prefabs as well. So say that I want to create uh, a prefab that holds all the objects that make up the basics of a world. So in this case, I'm going to create a oh, 
create empty. Oh, uh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, create empty. Uh, so let's just call these world objects. Move it up. And well, what makes the basic of a world? A light, a tank, and some ground. So I've just grouped them together. So I have this idea of this is what I want in all of my, my levels. And now I can make this world objects a prefab. And if I open this prefab, I can see the tank is still a prefab within this prefab. So that means that if I make any changes to the tank, uh, this prefab is automatically changed to also have those changes. Uh, yeah, so that way you can make modules for your game. Uh, so you can just build it with those modules. Uh, now, one more thing you can do with prefabs is uh, you can make what is known as prefab variants. Uh, and it's it's useful for when you have uh, an object and you want multiple. So of course, if you if you just want multiple copies of it, then prefabs are perfect. But if you want to have a an an object that's almost like the same, uh, and you also want multiple copies of that, because of course, if I just want another one, uh, a copy a copy that's almost like it but slightly different, then I could just drag it up here and make the changes I want, and they would just be overrides the, the changes I'm making. But in this case, I want to have a prefab with some changes. So in that case, I can right click here and say create prefab variant. And that will create a new prefab that is, is still linked to uh, the first tank prefab. So let's just call it tank two. And in this, this case, I just want tank two to uh, be pretty much the same, but I want it to have a different material. I want it to be red. So let's just, uh, let's just create, well, I'm just going to duplicate the tank material with control D and uh, I'm going to just make it red. There we go. And I'm going to apply it to tank two and the cannon. And that's the changes I want. So going back and now I can see, uh, the tank and the tank two are the same, except for the color. And the thing here is if I now make changes to the tank and decide that actually the cannon is going to be bigger again uh, and save and go back, we can see now tank two automatically ha have these changes still because it's still a tank. Uh, it's, it's still linked to this prefab. It's just that the changes I've made to the variant are like overrides, uh, but just to a prefab. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So there's a question from Frederick who says, um, I think I missed how you made the folder automatically to make the object. Uh, how do you make the folder automatically make the object into a prefab? If I right click, I can create a prefab, but it looks more like a singular prefab rather than a collection of them. Uh, I was thinking about the world objects. Well, if, if you, if you grab any, uh, if you grab any game object from the uh, hierarchy from the scene view and pull it into your assets folder in the projects tab, it automatically becomes a prefab. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did here was I created an empty game object in my hierarchy and dragged all the objects I wanted as, as a collection under that as children of that game object. And then I dragged that game object into my assets folder to create a prefab. So the pre, it, just, it becomes a prefab when you when you move it from the hierarchy. Maybe does that answer your question, Pike? Yeah, in general, if, if you want this collection of objects as a prefab, you just need them as children because when you take up uh, an object and make it a prefab, all the children will be a part of the prefab as well. Yes. I think that answered answered his question. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, uh, then it is time for another break. So I will see you back here at five minutes past two.
it's five minutes past two, so let's get started again. <clears throat> uh, let me just start by mentioning one thing I forgot about prefabs is they're also really good because you can make copies of them from code while the game is running. So if you are shooting bullets, you need the bullet to be a prefab. If you're spawning enemies, you need the enemy to be a prefab. Uh, so that's another really good thing about having your objects as prefabs. Uh, now, the next thing we're going to be doing for this is we are going to be importing some more assets and actually getting some more, uh, well, stuff into our game. And we're going to be starting with some 3D models. So let's create a folder for models. And again, these are some files I have. Uh, so I'm just going to be importing them. and. There are the 3D objects, and I have two. I have an alien called Lars, and I have a sword. And there they are. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, Lars is uh, an alien from an old game I made uh, a long time ago. And now you can actually see uh, we get a warning when I'm importing it. It's saying that some, uh, some of the stuff in there is being discarded because it, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, so that's just Unity telling us something that happened when it imported the file, but it's just a warning. It's not an error, so it's not like we can't use the, the model. It's just warning us that something has been deleted. Uh, now, when we have the models down here, we can actually drag them out kind of like prefabs and place them somewhere in the world. Uh, so let's do that with Lars and with the sword. And what we can actually see is uh, they have very different sizes. Uh, and oh yeah, before I move on to that, uh, one thing to mention is uh, just like with images, Unity can understand multiple uh, 3D object uh, formats, but the best one for use with Unity is the one called FBX. Uh, it's the one most developers in Unity uh, like. Uh, for example, I've seen some 3D developer or 3D modelers who just take their Max files or something like that and put it into Unity. And while it can work, uh, it sometimes causes problems. And also, for example, with Max, you have very different units. Uh, and there actually is a standard uh, thing for this. Uh, so, for example, if I go to the sort, uh, because I can actually see. Oh, I did not mean to open that. I meant to uh, have a look at it up here. There we go. So if I look at the sword here, uh, if I, for example, move it up next to the tank, I can see it looks like the sword is about one meter long, which seems reasonable. Uh, so the sword is pretty much the right size. And if I look down here, I can actually see uh, that's because it is already uh, converting units. Uh, so it's converting units so that it believes that what is one centimeter in, in the file, uh, or yeah, so I'm here it's saying that it's reading the file as being in centimeters. Uh, so if I disable this, and again, this is a file import setting, so I have to apply it before it does anything, then the sword is huge uh, because now it believes that uh, when uh, when the sort 3D model file says that it's a hundred high or long, then that means it should be a hundred meters long. Uh, so it sounds about right that it should be a hundred centimeters long. So let's just convert it back to centimeters and then it's, it's right. But for Lars, it's a, it doesn't look quite right. He's way too big. Uh, and here we can actually see that it, it believes that this file is in inches. So it's converting uh, whatever uh, Lars's height is from inches to uh, meters in, in Unity. But it's still way too big. Uh, so of course, I could start just scaling Lars using the, the scale part of the transform. But it's usually a better idea to use the scale factor in the import settings. Uh, so here, usually, you just have to uh, try uh, yeah, try do some trial and error to figure out how big it should be. Uh, so let's see one tenth of the size and apply. See how big that is. That looks much better already. Uh, so let's just get him up next to our box.
and let's just rotate it so we can see him. There we go. So now he's more like two meters high, uh, something like that. That seems more reasonable. Uh, but yeah, that's something to know when you import these 3D models, always check the size, uh, because quite often the models will be really big when you get them into Unity. Um, and depending on which program you've used, for example, with the sort here, you can see it actually could figure out what unit the file is in, and then it did the right uh, conversion, but it doesn't always work as you can see with last. Uh, yeah, now all, there are a lot of other settings here, but generally uh, I'm not an artist and I don't usually uh, use a lot of these settings. Uh, maybe some of you know more about uh, what all of these do than I do, uh, since these are uh, words that artists usually try to tell me when they're trying to explain what they uh, what they want me to do. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with how uh, vertices and triangles and so on are imported and compressed into Unity. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to go into detail with all of these settings, uh, but there is one more uh, set of settings that I am going to be talking about and that is about animation. Uh, because when, if you begin animation into the 3D model, then it gets imported into Unity with the model. Uh, and actually last year has an animation. And if I click the little arrow uh, next to his model uh, and make it a little bigger, there we go. I can actually see the animation. So there is an animation called take one right now. Um, and I can also see that animation uh, if I want to. Uh, the easiest way is to just select the model uh, and go to the animation tab. And here we have settings for the animations that have been imported. And you can see right now, it just says there's one clip here uh, that lasts for 241 frames. And if I want to see it, I can drag up from the bottom here and get a little image while I've selected take one. And I can play it and see what the animations look like. Um, and well, actually, here, uh, well, if, if you're the artist, then probably you know exactly which animations are which frames. Uh, I usually just get a list from my artist artist that uh, says there are this many anim animations, they are on these frames. Uh, and then I have to put them in here. And the way to do it is uh, you make as many clips as you need. So in this case, I have three clips, an idle animation, a walk animation, and a jump animation. So I make three. And then you just uh, set up which frames the each of them covers. So I start with the idle animation by selecting one of the takes. I'm going to call it idle. And the idle animation goes from zero to 20 frames. And again, I can have a look at it if I want. Uh, it doesn't seem to loop perfectly, but that's probably just because uh, the frames aren't quite perfect. Uh, but yeah, that's the idle. Then I have the walk, which is supposed to go from 20 frames to 55. And again, you can look at it. Doesn't look quite right, uh, but uh, yeah, it's good enough for this. So the last one was the jump animation. And that one goes from 60 to 98. And now I have my three animations and I can click apply. And now I'll, I can actually see here that the three animations are created here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so now I've set up the animations uh, and told it how to import them, uh, but that's not going to be enough. So even if I start the game right now, we will see that Lars is not animated. Uh, he's just standing there. So let's back. Uh, so what I'm going to need now is uh, an animation controller uh, to actually hold these animations. And I'm just going to create my animation controller right here in the models folder. Um, and again, it's just a file that Unity creates. So I right click, create, and choose animator controller. And I'm going to call it the uh, last animator. 
And if I double click that, it'll open a new window called the animator. Uh, and this is what we call a state tree. Uh, and if you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Uh, and if you hold Alt, you can drag around to see all of it. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in a bit again so we can actually read what, uh, what it says. We don't need so much of that. Uh, now, what we need in this state tree are the, uh, the states. Um, yeah, the, the, the states, so one state for each animation. Uh, and we can create that really easily by just dragging the animations into our animator. So I want the idle, the jump, and the walk. And then I can drag them around just to make it easy to see where everything, or well, see all of them uh, there. Uh, and now the animations are actually in this uh, this state tree. They're part of this animator, um, and this is already a, a a big part of it because it is actually possible from code to change between the different animations now. Uh, but we can do a bit more in the state tree as well. Uh, so the first thing is uh, we have a line here from entry onto idle, and it has been colored uh, orange. And that's because it has made idle the default state. Uh, and the default state is basically just the state that it's going to go into right when the animator starts. Uh, so if I didn't want it to be idle, if I wanted it to be walk, I could right click and say set as layer default state. Uh, but in this case, idle is probably good because if the player doesn't do anything and Lars is just standing there, she should be in idle state. So let's keep that as the default state. Uh, now, it's also possible to make automatic transitions, uh, and those basically will uh, make it so that when you're done with an animation, it will automatically go to another animation. So, for example, if I had a falling state with a falling animation, uh, probably when I'm done with the jump animation, it should just transition into the falling animation. Uh, and you can do that by right-clicking and say make transition, and then click on the state it should transition into. Uh, now, right now, I don't ha actually have a falling animation, so I can't really do that. Uh, but it can also be used for something else, and that is looping. Uh, because in my case, when the idle animation is done playing, it should just play the idle animation again. So let's do that. Say make transition, and just transition into the idle. And the walk should do the same, because uh, that's also a looping animation. Uh, yeah, and... You, again, the inspector is going to show you some information about these. Uh, so the important ones are probably just the ones up here. You can see which animation this state actually uses. Uh, so it is possible to have the same uh, animation be used by multiple states. Uh, and then you can change what the speed is. So maybe you have a walk uh, state where it's slow, and then it's, well, walking and running animations are not the same. But in case you have some animation where it makes sense to have the same animation, but sometimes it's played uh, fast and sometimes it's played slow. Uh, then you can use speed to change that. Uh, and it is also possible to actually write code that interacts with this. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was our animations. And I've set the idling to be the default state, which means if I start the game now, we should actually be able to see Lars idle. So let's see if that works. And oh, no. Uh, yeah, so it still doesn't work, right? Because I forgot one thing. Uh, because we've now set up the animator controller, but we're not using it. Uh, so that's an important thing to know. Just because you've created something down here in the assets folder, usually that's not enough for it to actually do anything in the game. Uh, so we are going to need to apply this animator uh, to Lars and say he has to use it. So that's fairly simple. I just choose the game object that is Lars in uh, in the scene here. Uh, let's actually just move him a bit so we can see him when we start the game. Just like that. Uh, and now I want to use this animator on him. I can just do that by adding it as a component. So I just drag it over here, and it will create an animator component using this animator. 
Uh, and it says it doesn't have an avatar, but that's okay because this is just a 3D model that uh, these animations work with. So it'll automatically figure out uh, that this is the model it's supposed to be animating. So that should do it. Let's try. And there we go. The animation is working. Uh, so we have an animation and it's looping. Uh, now we do have one more thing uh, we can do with these 3D models uh, and that is texturing. Uh, so uh, I don't have a texture for last, uh, but I do have a texture for this sort. So the first thing I'm going to need is to import that. So let's just go back to pictures and I have the sort texture. So again, I'm going to import it just like with everything else by dragging it down here. Sometimes it can take a moment for it to recognize the file type and figure out that this is something that it, can, it knows how to import. So I just reach that there. And I just have to make sure that it is set as a texture default. That's correct. Um, and now I want to use it on the sword. And just like with the penguins, I can simply take it from down here, drag it up here, and it will automatically create a new material uh, for this sword texture and use that material on the object. And we can see uh, this texture is a, an unwrapped texture uh, made for the sword. So it automatically figures out uh, how this was unwrapped and, uh, and wraps when it's applied to the, the, the sword. Uh, so yeah, that looks right. Uh, so that's how you use a texture on a 3D model. Um, yeah, that was it for 3D models, I think. Any questions before we move on? Yeah, so there was a question about the little camera preview um, that you get when you press the camera. Is it possible to keep that window there even when you're not selecting the main camera? Uh, not as far as I know, but what you could do is take the game window and have it like this. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can see what the camera sees even when you're doing all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. It, it would be cool to have that little thing in there all the time. Maybe there's a way to do it. I'm, I'm going to look that up. Uh, another question. Uh, the, the preferred file, file format for Unity was FBX, right? That was the file format. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. FBX. That's awesome. Uh, this character, Lars, is this something you think you could share with uh, with other people that they can play with them? Uh, I, well, I don't really know actually. It's something yeah. that we made for a small game I made with some okay. people a long time ago. Uh, okay. So I don't really know if. Well, probably we, we can look at that it. after the workshop, and then we can, if if we can share it, we can get permission from the artist. We can share it with everyone. Uh, yeah, well, in that case, I'll be moving on to sounds. Uh, so we can add sounds to our game as well. So again, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import some sounds. So I'll just be creating a folder. Uh, we'll just call it audio. And let's go. And Nikolai, there is a way for you to share your sound uh, in oh. Zoom. And uh, we that would probably be useful then. Yeah, we, we shared the instructions at the beginning of so it would be in the top of the chat, uh, but it's somewhere in the oh. screen sharing options, I think. Yeah, I think I have. Uh, no, huh. uh, I might I will have to DM, I'll DM you the instructions on how to do it. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll just import these in the meanwhile. So let's just import these into audio. Uh, yeah, and I forget what file type these actually are, but again, Unity recognizes quite a few different ones. Let's see what this is. Yeah, this is just an MP3. Uh, but yeah, you can use uh, many different uh, sound file types. Uh, and again, you have some import settings. Uh, the thing I find most uh, interesting about uh, Audio here is probably that you can you can check what the sounds sound like uh, just by using play here. Uh, let me just 
quickly see if I can share audio. Um, so. Oh, share computer sound. Between two. So I believe you should be able to hear my sounds now as well. So you should be able to hear the coin drop sound when I play this. Yeah, it works. Great. Uh, in that case, uh, yeah, so now we have our uh, sounds in here. Now we want to get them into the game. Uh, and in order to do that, we are going to need uh, a new type of component called audio source. And audio source is basically just something that can play a sound. Uh, so in this case, I don't have a coin in my game. Uh, so I need something that can play the uh, audio sound. Let me just move the sword out of the way. And let's actually just have the sword be the one to play the coin sound. Uh, so I selected the sword game object. Then I select add component and I search for audio source. And there it is. And we can see now it shows in the scene view that this is an audio source. So sound can come from here. And uh, we have this, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, we have all of these settings for how we want to play the sound. The most important one is which sound are we playing, the audio clip. Uh, so here we can track the sound we want up here. Or we can click here to select between the audios that we have, audio files that we have. Uh, and now this audio source is one that can play the coin drop sound. Uh, now, if you're, um, if you're audio designers, you might also find this field really interesting. It's possible to create mixing groups in Unity, and uh, that way you can change how sounds sound. Uh, we're not going to go into detail with that, but it is possible to to do a lot with uh, with the audio you have. Uh, yeah. Then we have uh, some settings. Most of these are fairly self-explanatory, at least the important ones. Mute, then you won't be able to hear the sound. Uh, play and awake makes it so that we actually hear this uh, from the beginning. So you can loop a sound. Uh, volume, again, self-explanatory. Same for pitch. Uh, now, one that's really important here is the spatial blend, where we can change between, well, let's call it 2D and a 3D sound. But it makes most sense to just think of it as either a sound is 3D or it's not. And uh, if we hear this right now, when I start, because it's playing awake, we should hear the coin drop sound. There it was. Uh, but if I change this to a 3D sound and try again, we should still hear the sound, but it should be lower. There it was, and it was lower. Um, and the reason for that is when it's a 3D sound, uh, it's a sound that gets louder the near to the source you are. Uh, and if you get too far away, you can't hear it. So it works like sound actually works in the real world. Uh, you can also hear where it's coming from. So because uh, if the sword is right to right next to me on my left, I'll actually be able to hear that it's on my left if I if I have a stereo set up. Uh, but if it's a if it's not a three D sound uh, and well you're what they call two D, then uh, it doesn't work like that. It's just a sound that's being played directly to the player, so they can hear it with the same volume no matter where in the world they are. Uh, in this case, I do actually want it to be a 3D sound. Uh, but if I play it like this, uh, I don't really hear it as though it's coming from my left, even though it's right on the left of the tank. Uh, and the reason for that is because the audio source is not the only thing that's important for how we hear audio in Unity. Uh, the other component we need to have a look at is the, the audio listener. And as the name suggests, that's the one that makes us actually hear the sound. So we hear the sound as though we are standing where the audio listener is. And the standard is uh, for the audio listener to be on the main camera. So you can see it's right here. But in this case, I would like it to uh, to be on the tank so that when the tank is close to something, we can hear that, not when the camera is close. Uh, because, well, that way, it, it's a bit weird if the tank drives up to something and then when it drives past it and the camera gets close to it, that's when the sound becomes loud. Uh, so I'm going to remove the audio listener here, here, new component. Uh, oh yeah, and 
notice how because this is a prefab, it's now actually saying that I have removed this, but it's on the prefab. Uh, I'm just going to apply this to the prefab of tank because I've actually meant to do it on the prefab. And then we're going to add it to the tank instead. So let's just open the tank prefab and add an audio listener. And it's right there. And go back. And now we should hear the coin drop on our left. And at least for me, it was very obvious that was on the left. Uh, so that's how 3D sounds work. Uh, but actually, it probably shouldn't just be playing this on a wake. So I'm going to disable that. And now that means it's not going to be played at all. But uh, if we had some code, the code can make it play. Uh, so now we've just made it so that this sort is an object that can play the coin drop sound. And then we can have a a script that tells it when to do it. Uh, now the other uh, audio file I have here is some background music uh, called Rocket Power, uh, which is a uh, free to use piece of music. Uh, so I'm going to add that as background music. So uh, in order to do that, again, I'm going to need a, a audio source. And this time I'm just going to create a game object audio source uh, because I don't want it to be a specific object like the tank playing the background music or anything. I just want there to be background music. So I just create a new invisible object that's just in the world and it's going to be playing music. So I'll just call that background music. And it's fairly uh, uh, often that you'll find that there are a number of these invisible objects that are just in a scene to do things. It can be whole uh, scripts that are uh, that just needs to be in the scene that with custom uh, custom scripts, uh, or it can be stuff like background music. Uh, and we can see it has this audio source, which it should. And I'll just add the rocket power as the audio clip. Uh, now background music should start right away, so play and awake should. Uh, should be enabled, and I also want it to loop. Uh, and this time, I do actually want it to be 2D because it shouldn't be. It's not like a radio where when you go near the radio, it should be playing music. It should just be playing always uh, for the player to hear. Uh, probably this is a bit loud, so I'll just set the volume down a bit, uh, just so the uh, background music is not overpowering. And that should pretty much be it. So let's see if that works. And it does. We have back. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, just one last thing uh, about the audio listener. It's really important that you should only have one audio listener in your scene uh, and exactly one. Uh, if there isn't an audio listener, then your audio is not going to work. Uh, and actually, Unity is going to say, that's wrong, so you've messed up somehow, and then it's going to just add an, an audio listener for you, and it'll just add it to the main camera. Uh, at least that's how it used to be. Uh, so make sure you have an audio listener, but not more than one, uh, because that also gives you warnings. Uh, yeah. Any questions about sounds? We didn't have any specific questions about sounds. Uh, we had a, a question about uh, file size, file sizes, file size limits, uh, audio and animated models. Is there a limit to how many, how big files can be imported? Uh, no, not generally, no. Um, it, it can take a long time to load though. Um, so especially if it's loading in the middle of something, usually everything that's in a scene loads when you go into that scene. So you'll just have huge loading times trying to go into the scene or opening the game. Uh, and of course, your games are going to be huge, which can also be a problem, especially if you're making something for mobile. They have restrictions on how big the, the games can actually be. Uh, but yeah, Unity can import really huge files. Yeah, so for, for like if you're doing a game jam with other people and you want a really big file, sometimes it makes sense to put in a placeholder 
uh, when you're working, especially if you have a slower computer, and just uh, work with some primitive shapes and then put it in later when you're actually building the game. Yeah, so that way you can still test it quickly uh, yeah. with, with just place solar graphics. But but that's only necessary for when you put the thing in the scene view, in the in the scene itself. You can put everything into your assets folder and that won't be a problem. Yeah, yeah so that might be a, an important uh, detail that just because something is down here in the assets folder, if it isn't used, then it doesn't slow down the load times. Uh, okay, well, uh, if there were no more questions, then let's move move on to building. Uh, because we have pretty much all the things that I showed in the beginning. We have our 3D world, we have 3D models, we have some sound. So now it's time to uh, get our game out into the world. Uh, because right now we can only play it in Unity. And that's not really how we want our final users to be able to play it. Uh, so we're going to go to File and select Build Settings. Uh, and building is really just make a file uh, that is a, a file that is playable. Uh, so the first thing we need to have a look at is the scenes in build window here at the top. This is the list of which scenes are actually part of your game. So right now it's empty, which means nothing is in my game. Uh, so if I try to build right now, it would not work. Uh, so you need to add all the scenes that you want up here and you can do that two ways one is you can drag a scene from your project view so if i want a sample scene i can add like that uh, the other is if you have the scene open uh, here then you can just say add open scenes uh, and then it adds the one that's open right now uh, and now you can see i have two scenes uh, so these two scenes will be part of uh, of my build uh, and you can also see that there are some numbers out here Generally, these numbers are not super important. It is possible to uh, reference a scene by using this number, but generally uh, it's better to use the name, uh, which means then these numbers are not important, with the exception of zero, uh, because zero is the, the scene that, uh, that when you open the game, you get into that scene. So that's your start scene. Uh, so right now, if I were to build this and then open the game, I would go into my sample scene. If I want it, it to be the second scene, then I need to drag that up and make that the first scene. So that is scene zero. Uh, if you decide actually one of the scenes in my uh, in my list here is not one I want after all. Uh, so for example, now my sample scene, actually that's not part of my game after all. Uh, I just want to go directly to the second scene and that's my whole game then I can just disable it like this. And then you'll see now the second scene is the only one that's active and it's number zero. Uh, yeah, the other window that's important here is the platform. So this is where you decide what you're actually making a game for. Uh, and you can see there are a number of options and some of them may depend on which packages you chose to install when you installed Unity. Uh, so for example, you might not have Android here, if you decide that you actually do want to be able to build for Android, you then need to go to your Unity hub. Uh, and if I just make it here and go to your installs, uh, it's possible to click on the version. So this is the version I'm using right now. You go here and say add modules. Uh, and for example, for Android, you need the Android build support uh, or you won't be able to build for Android. Uh, so yeah. That's the that's where you choose what you're actually building for. So PC, Mac, and Linux, that'll build for whatever you're on right now. So for example, I'm sitting on a Windows machine. That means I will be making an exe file that is uh, a game that can be run on a Windows PC. Uh, then Android is for Android phones, WebGL. Then you get a web page that you can put online and play. Uh, and yeah, so on, so on. Uh, now for each one, there are also some settings, uh, but in general, most of it works by default. So you won't have to think about that unless you have some specific needs. Uh, now, one thing to note is if, for example, I were to decide I was actually building this for web, I want a web page with my game, uh, you actually need to switch platform uh, using this button before you can build. Uh, and what happens when you switch platform is it re-imports all of your assets 
so that they are optimized for the new platform. However, that can take a really long time if you have a lot of assets. So it can be a really good idea to, when you're creating a new game, just as the first thing, go to the build settings and switch platform to the one you're actually building for. Uh, because if you have already added a bunch of files, it can take a long time uh, to switch platform. Like if, if you have like a full scale, really big game project, it can take hours to switch platform. So if you can uh, do that from the beginning, that way they're imported right from the start. Uh, in my case, I do actually just want to build for a PC. So I'll just keep it as this platform. Uh, that's what this Unity logo means, is that this is the platform that it's on right now. Uh, and yeah, then I can just build. Uh, build and run will automatically run the game, if possible. Uh, but yeah, I just want to build it so I have the file. So let's just make a new folder here. and select folder. So then it will build my game to that folder. And this can take a while as well. So I'll just see, are there any questions in the meanwhile? Yeah, so there's a question. If you wanted to build to multiple platforms, which one should you choose first? Uh, I'm not really sure there's one that's better than the others in that case. However, there are some options. Uh, so. If you're in that case where you have something you want to build to multiple, uh, either you have to just accept there's going to be multiple multiple times where you have to have this wait time where, while you're switching platform, or it's also possible to uh, have the project on multiple computers and say on this computer it's uh, set to have a the platform of PC for example, on this one it's Android, on this one it's web, uh, and then just share. Uh, the files with version control or something between the computers so all the changes to scripts and models and scenes and whatever are shared between the computers but uh, the build settings are different between them. Uh, the last option is to use Unity Cloud Build uh, which is to uh, use a build server from Unity where uh, then it's the Unity servers that really have to take a long time for it but you don't have that wait time on your computer. Uh, now, uh, this popped up when it finished building, and this is my build. Uh, so I didn't set an icon, so it just got the Unity icon, uh, but this is my game. And if I double click it, uh, I will probably... Oh, okay, it started on the other screen. Let's... So it's way too big for this screen, but you can see the game is running and it's working. Uh, Uh, so the build is working. Uh, yeah, that was actually everything uh, we had to get through. Any questions? Yeah, I have a few questions. So um, you mentioned uh, working together or having multiple computers and version management and stuff like that. Um, could you sort of explain what does it take to work together with another person in Unity? Well, so there are multiple ways to work together. Uh, you're going to need um, some kind of what is known as version control, which some of you, uh, uh, yeah, some of you may know already, and uh, some of you might not. Uh, but it's basically a way to share files. Uh, and the most common one uh, or most popular these days is Git. Uh, that's the one that's really taken over. You may know it from GitHub or uh, something like that. Uh, there are multiple clients for it, but it is a way to share files between multiple users, uh, and then you can update the files and share the updates with each other. Uh, and that works for Unity as well. Uh, you can make a Unity project uh, in a, well, wh what is known as a Git repository, and that'll basically be like a server where you sh share your version of the Unity project with the server, and then another person can get it from the server, make changes to it, put it on the server, and then you can get their changes. Uh, and it works even if 
you're both working on it at the same time. Although then there are some things to be aware of, uh, like uh, if you both work in the same scene at the same time, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, <laughs> because the thing is, it, it just uh, looks at all files as text. Uh, and Unity actually have a, a setting which is set by default that it should save everything like prefabs and scenes as text. Uh, at least I believe it's the default now. Um, and that means that Git can do it, but if you add two game objects, then Git really quickly get confused. Uh, and then you'll get a, a scene where it's tried to merge both of your changes uh, to get what both of you have done, but it's probably going to fail. And then you'll just get a corrupted scene uh, that can't be opened. And it's kind of the same for prefabs. If both of you work on the same prefab at the same time, it will probably just uh, do it wrong. Uh, so it can be important if, if you're doing something like that to know who's working on what, uh, but it is possible. Uh, one way it's, that's often done is everybody makes their own scene and works on stuff. And then you have one real scene where when something is done, you add it to the real scene, and then only one person can do that at the at a time. Yeah. There is also a Unity uh, Colab, which is version control built into Unity. I don't have super much experience with it, uh, but it's basically version control within Unity, where you can share, uh, well, all of your assets uh, and your progress. Yeah. Um, so. Col collab Unity Collab is, is is sort of limited in some ways, but it's also quite easy to use. I'm not sure if it's possible to use it for free. If there's a free version, if you need to pay for it, um, but if you're working with some other people and you're willing to pull together your money, it could, it could be a nice uh, option. Um, if you so, there's one question, and then I also have a question. Uh, Falek asks, when you're sharing the game, would you have to would would you have to include the entire folder? Unity for artists demo, or uh, you'd have to include the entire folder. You can't just send the Unity for artists demo. And I'm I'm thinking that he's thinking about the executable. So the app yeah, you can't just send yeah, the so executable. This, yeah, so this ex executable wouldn't be enough because all the data that the executable needs, like all the models and stuff, is in here. So if you don't have all of this, it's not going to work. And that's also if you're not sharing it with another person to work with. It's just if you're sharing it with someone to play the game. Yeah, right. you need you yeah. need everything that's in this folder, or yeah. you can't run it. Yeah, and if you're if you're sharing it with another artist or another programmer, you can't share the build because the build you can't open in Unity. It it just opens the game directly. Yeah. Um. So, if you don't want to use um a uh, a version management tool and these sort of tools, if you just want to send the project so someone else can open Unity on their computer. Would you just m share the folder, or how would you do that? Yeah, you can share the folder. So I have mine. Uh, let's just see if I can find Unity for Artists. Uh, yeah, so this folder is where my Unity project is. Uh, I would just share this whole folder. Uh, just zip it and send it, and then uh, someone else could open it in Unity. And that's where you would use the Unity Hub uh, on the project. You have the add. So when they have, if they when they have the folder on their computer, they can use the add, and then browse to where the project is and select the folder, uh, and then it would show up here. Yeah. So that that's kind of like the roughest way to work together. But if you if you're working actively together, you you do want to use some version management. Maybe we can get into that in another workshop, yeah. or we and can send some links just, later. Yeah. Uh, don't use Dropbox. People have tried it, and it's horrible. Okay. <laughs> noted okay well um you guys are free to to send more questions into the chat for the next 10 minutes and also if you try to work with this after the workshop and have some questions absolutely feel free to email or go on discord or facebook or whatever and and ask questions uh i think that's what it's all about uh, helping each other um we didn't really make a, a fully functional game um uh, because that opens up a whole another uh, box, like Pandora's box of interactivity and things. And I think the the idea with this specific workshop was that you are just familiar with the tools so that you can work together with 
um, other people who might be more coming in from the programming side so that you can easily jump in and understand what's going on. Um, but it would, it would be fun to work with the interactivity as well at some point. And I'm sure you guys can also now hopefully have sort of a foundation where you can uh, play with it and, and get better. Um, so this is super great. Uh, Nikolai, um, thank you so much for, uh, for, this, uh, for this workshop. I have one request of you before you leave. Um, I have a survey for you guys to fill out. Uh, allow me to share the link in the chat and I will also just um, uh, put a, oops, uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, yes, here is the link and I will also um, share uh, this QR code here. I'm not sure if that works. It doesn't work. Anyway, um, Please use the feedback form. Please uh, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, if you have any ideas or questions or suggestions for other things in the future. Um, I, uh, I I really hope you guys will keep playing with this and we would love to see what you guys are working with. Uh, please be social. Please share your thoughts and your ideas. Uh, share your ambitions and maybe we can make your games into a real thing. Um, it's so cool if you guys are able to make games on your own, but it's even better if you find other people to work with. And um, there's a lot of artists that want to do it. And there's also a lot of programmers who are really good at the, the programming side who are looking for talented artists to help them out. Uh, and that's that's ultimately the best way to learn is to, to um, experiment and just do it together with others. So um, please uh, be extroverted. I think that is uh, important for your future development. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take care.